I'm going to be presenting the speakers for this next panel on titled Towards Sustainable and Just Food Systems. And our first speaker is Jahi Chappelle, coming from the Center for Agroecology, Water and Resilience at Coventry University. And he was a PhD student of John during the 2000s. Finally, uh, give John some more of what he wants and talk about math some more, uh, which is what he was hoping I would do when I, I came in as a recovering engineer. Um, <laughs> I uh, am going to recapitulate my graduate career and probably disappoint him on that part by not spending very much time on math and skipping it to things that I think are uh, more important, though the math is also important. But. Uh, so, you know, so when I came up with this talk, I, I was hoping to pull what you might call a, a full Vandermeer, uh, which is to think about and sort of discover some kind of new cool mathematical insight and present it uh, vividly and describe it some interesting way and then use that to make other points completely unrelated to math. <laughs> Perhaps, you know, a very subtle point that you might miss. Uh, this is instead going to be uh, maybe a half Vandermeer or a relaxed Vandermeer. And actually, because I'm going to skip most of the math and actually talk about something else that I just thought of, well, it was part of it, but I'm going to change the, the focus. Sort of a reverse double Vandermeer. Just, I'm going to change my mind and talk about something that's similar but not quite the same. <laughs> so uh, the, the, the mathy portion was just the idea that you can think of, um, for ecological systems, a phase space. You can think of mapping predator and prey dynamics or, or other variables on the same space and how they interact over time or how they, they vary over time. And so this sort of made me think, uh, oh yeah, I've got the classic lynch and hare, the classic roadrunner and uh, coyote. Uh, so this is the stuff I'm skipping. <laughs> um, but so it, it, it made me think of actually a uh, uh, these slides that John presented at his Distinguished University uh, lecture, Distinguished University Professor lecture a couple years ago, and he talked about his various students as being in different spaces you could think of in terms of uh, focusing on the moral compass of political activism, the moral compass of sociopolitical analysis, or his passions for theoretical ecology, for con direct contact with the natural world. And I thought, well, you know, this is sort of a static model. I, I actually, I don't, I don't resent where he put me, but I don't think I'm just in that space. But if you think of over time, you know, I think as individual students and students spinning out of his lab, when we sort of go back and forth between a lot of different areas in terms of sometimes more focusing on the moral compass, sometimes more on, on passion for more of the abstract science or theory or direct contact with nature as opposed to the social justice elements. And those are all part of the same system, but you might be in a different part of the system at different times. So I was going to go and explain Lorenz tractors and things, and we're not going to do that. Uh, <laughs> So skipping to, uh, I'll go back to some of that, but probably not most of it. So skipping to it, because we were talking about uh, social change and uh, Doug Balcher's uh, great presentation about communication and working with people, um, I wanted to focus on sort of the punchline of the talk that all that stuff was getting to, uh, which is a piece I'm working on with my friend and colleague, Derek Grady Lovelace at American University, that right now we're calling the extension of everything. Um, and it's an idea for a different way about thinking about universities. Uh, to some extent, uh, the sort of two major poles that uh, I think a lot of us from John's uh, uh, lab have worked on has often been in NGOs or academia. And you know, there's people who go into government or do things entirely different, and sort of there, there would be dragons in terms of uh, uh, that map sometimes. But um, 
you know, those are sort of the two poles that we often go between. And I think a lot of us, it's not because uh, we want to exclude some of the elements of the other el of the other institution that we like thinking about theory and thinking about uh, math and direct kind of nature. And we like, uh, and it's important to us to be uh, uh, involved morally. And that uh, we should be challenging maybe the university to be one of the places that is able to encompass that whole thing so we don't have to cycle in and out or choose one or the other. Uh, and I think there's a variety of ways to, to think about this. One of the things that uh, occurred to me is, I mean, I think, so I, I have gone back and forth in my own career. I, I started in grad school thinking I definitely did not want to be in academia. Uh, and actually, one of, we've had several good quotes from John. One of the quotes that finally got me thinking, maybe I should go to academia, I'm not completely against it. He said, if you don't go to academia, who will mentor students like you? And you know, he was a really unique mentor. Um, so uh, uh, that was that was somewhat compelling, and, and I, I had some great students at Washington State that sort of said the same thing that you know we didn't know we could do some of this stuff until you know we had a a vendor a vendor meerkat here. <laughs> <laughs> but so I think a lot of people entering academia or already in academia want to engage communities, and they want to engage communities in ways that go beyond the deficit or diffusion model of just trying to fill in knowledge with someone or put knowledge out into the ether and hope it soaks in uh, in the right place. And one of the key elements in terms of being a, a scholar, I think, that often scholars or, or even people in, in, in jails often miss is uh, a big key for science and social change is listening. Um, it's telling stories, that's a part of it, but it's listening and listening to other people's stories and actually engaging with them as a human being. And that's sort of, in a, a Machiavellian way, that's the most effective way to convince them of what you want. <coughs> if you connect truly as human beings. Uh, and there's lots of interesting work on this actually at ITP. Uh, the NGO I, I just left, we're doing rural climate dialogues where we go into rural communities and talk with uh, a demographically selected representative selection of uh, citizens there. And you see people come in literally saying, I thought it was gonna be some kind of liberal kumbaya and ending saying, you know, thank you for inviting me. You know, I, re you know, I don't agree with everything, but you know, I'm ready to sign up for a plan on fighting climate change in my community and explain to the other citizens, you know, this is why we have to do this. You know, I'm not getting into the debate of it exists or not. We know this happening in our community, let's act on it. And so you see this when I think people talk to each other as, as people. And uh, we even saw, uh, let's see, I just put it down. Uh, last year, uh, or no, this year, a study by Brookman and Kala, where they <coughs> confirmed a study that was discredited last year by uh, LaCour, I don't know if you, uh, any of you remember that study, it was on This American Life, but that you can convince people to change a very deeply held opinion. And in this case, it was about uh, their stance towards homosexuality in the course of a 10 to 20 minute conversation. And that original study was uh, uh, actually refuted and the data was fabricated, but the people who discovered that did the, basically a similar study again and found very similar results, not precisely the same. Um, but uh, just to, to read one of the summaries, uh, so this is in science. Uh, Existing research depicts intergroup prejudices as deeply ingrained, requiring intense inter intervention to lastingly reduce. Here we show that a single approximately 10 minute conversation encouraging actively taking the perspective of others can markedly reduce prejudice for at least three months. Uh, they demonstrated this with a door to door uh, sampling with 501 randomized voters. Uh, and they found that these opinions did change and stayed changed more than three months. And it's not that it disappeared at three months, that was as long as the study was. Uh, and commenting on it, on 538, uh, a, a, a news website, they said, well, you know, these dialogues last 20, 10 to 20 minutes. They're sort of Socratic. Canvassers are aiming for a conversation in which they ask questions, they don't uh, ask questions and the subject is to talk. They don't tell people ahead of time what conclusion they want to reach. There's no sermon built in. The goal is that by the end, subjects have built up an empathy with a group of people different than themselves. And so they found this with uh, uh, talking about uh, trans individuals, so it wasn't homophobia this time, it was trans, which actually you know, had at least as much, if not more, discrimination. So, you know, this, this listening, this interacting in a different way, uh, uh, I think this is really important and had a lot of potential power that we, we don't take advantage of. And I think in this room last year, uh, I was here for a food sovereignty conference, which I think many of the same people organized, um, putting from strength to strength here. Uh, S3 professor Lucita Taylor, she talked about working with communities uh, in Detroit. She's saying, well, I worked with them for one, two, three years before I even begin to think about papers to write. Uh, she said this is because those first couple of years when they were talking to her, they weren't trying to give her data. 
That wasn't for a paper. That was getting to know her. That was talking to a person, and I'm getting to build that trust. Uh, and so she said, you know, what they're telling me at that time is not for publication. And I dare you, she said, I dare you not to publish for three years when you work with the community. As a tenured professor, I think she maybe underplayed the, the challenge of that. Um, and so that's not really viable often in our, our current academic systems. But to me, that just speaks of a need to change the academic system. And I think that the time is right for a regime shift. Uh, so one of the previous slides, actually, we'll go back a little bit. So uh, the, the late Dick Levin, who many of you uh, knew, uh, one of his, his noted pieces was on Schmulhausen's Law. Uh, derived from a, an, an, a, a Russian uh, zoologist. And boiling it down, oversimplifying it a bit, uh, one of his observations was that a system that sees lots of variability is at the edge of, edge of its tolerance. The more variability you see, that means the more stress the system is. And a system under stress is one that's also ripe for regime change. And so I think these fluctuations, these variations we see in society and the kind of careers academics want and take, uh, that shows there's a system, again, ripe for, for change. And if we think about history as a space, so when you think about the passion of moral compass, and, and so you're thinking of this now as an abstract concept in space, there's also a similar idea from uh, history, and the civil rights scholar Zoe Trod has talked about uh, civil rights uh, uh, activists like uh, James Baldwin and uh, Ralph Elton writing about returning later in time to a similar historical space, so sort of a spiral, it's a parallel time, so civil rights is parallel to abolition. And that, uh, it's sort of like the, the saying, the history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And so when we see these opportunities where we don't get the regime shift that we want, you know, I think sometimes we take it uh, as a failure. And it's not that we shouldn't learn and try and do better, because often we, always, we can do better. But sometimes failure is just the dynamics of the system. Sometimes random things happen. We understand that in ecology. Uh, I think we sometimes over blame ourselves socially when we don't get that change we want right then. Which again, not to say that we don't need to keep trying or we don't need to learn, uh, but that when it comes back around again, when we feel like we're at another historical juncture, rather than going, ah, oh, God, we tried to change it last time and it didn't work, uh, that actually is a new opportunity. That's a new opportunity, like on this uh, Lorenzo tractor, that you might be spinning around this trajectory and you feel like you're just going to go around it forever. You can see that. You might be spinning around this trajectory. But at some point, you might actually be able to jump over to a whole different, uh, whole different base of attraction. So, you know, the kind of academic system or academic work that uh, I'm talking about is not necessarily viable uh, right now. But it's no reason that we can't we can't push for it, despite I'd say also the tradition some of us carry of uh, a supposed amoral science, um, which I would argue, ironically based on peer-reviewed literature, that is both damaging and damning to view our science as amoral. Uh, I would challenge it as an adherent of faith that amorality improves the quality of our science, and I'd be happy to see any evidence that amorality makes better for science. Better science, not anecdotes, not personal stories, not the kind of things that we discard when someone else says, "I don't believe in climate change because of this thing that happened." But actual systematic studies shows amorality makes your science better. I, I would I would be interested in that conversation because I don't think it's true, and I know from my own experiences at least. So using an anecdote, but. In my own experience, <laughs> using that to prove the point I already believe, um, in my own experience is uh, uh, that idea of selective amorality, because it is selective. We don't believe well, you should be amoral as to whether or not you practice good science or ethical science. You should you know, abuse humans or uh, make up your results. Those are moral decisions that have a purpose, but they are moral decisions. So we're selectively amoral. And that selective amorality does not play well with communities, in my experience. Uh, when you, when you tell them, well, as an academic, I might be able to help you improve whatever, you know, build a, a better sustainable uh, uh, agriculture or a new building that's uh, more sustainable or creates jobs, but I won't get any credit for that unless they write a paper that you'll never read. That doesn't make them feel really valued. That doesn't make them feel like the university values them. Um, and just as a, another distinct uh, example, I think, you know, the amorality of, amorality of academia can sap the support of communities who might otherwise be uh, convinced of things. And uh, uh, at one of my previous jobs, we were at a branch campus, and it was built to, to, uh, to serve that community specifically as a branch campus. And we were told by the NAACP, by labor, by several different groups in the community that the most valuable thing we produced was a report on inequality within that county by one of my colleagues, a sociologist. 
Uh, the university said, well, sure, you published these other things that are peer reviewed in the past, but you want to be promoted, promoted to full professor. What have you done? I mean, you've had that report, but that's just the community. That's not peer reviewed. I mean, that attitude that it doesn't count for anything, again, the community was not pleased that the guy said, well, you know, I can't get promoted because I just helped you guys out. Um, so I think that there are, there's real costs to that approach. And so what we propose, just in the brief time uh, left, uh, we propose a couple of things that we, we have a couple sort of counter proposals to some of the, the questions people typically ask. But uh, in terms of, you know, well, what about, how do you evaluate the science if you don't have peer review? And the reason we call it the extension of everything is we have a model for doing that. Uh, the extension model of the United States is by no means was or is perfect. It, it still exists. But people can be evaluated by, oh, we got feedback from the community you worked with. Did they think it was useful? Did they feel like they were respected? Did you accomplish something? Did practices change? Did you build a building that was more sustainable? Were jobs created? And in a way, I think this is actually interesting and a, a improved challenge, I would say, for our science in some ways, in that uh, I think when we, when we don't value the science of practice, which is a different kind of science, when we don't value that, we're sort of doing the thing where uh, economists say, some economists say, you know, well, that works in practice, but it's check out in theory. <laughs> so I think we really need to uh, uh, reconsider some of that model. And we're not proposing that that should be the entire model of academia. The, the regime shift we're proposing is that that be a model, that it's a coach in your track, that a new extension is a, a coach in your track equal. Not everyone has to do it. Not everyone wants to do it. But the people who are coming in were there who already want to do that, that that's something they're able to do and achieve the same kind of career course uh, and be rewarded uh, for it in, in these, these other ways. So to... Uh, to wrap up, um, like many others, I, I owe a lot to John, and, and I've managed to find something that really works with both my, my passion and my moral compass uh, through uh, working with him. And uh, I definitely don't believe in the great man or the great woman, the great person version of history, where one person's the fulcrum for change. Uh, but I do believe that great people together in communities can change things. And so I think John truly is a great person who has helped build a great community of people. And I'm really honored to be part of that. Thanks. what was truly an excellent and entertaining talk. Um, now I'm going to say that one of the reasons why you're not going to find this amoral science to, to make a comparisons to is you're absolutely right that the, the university has always played a role in producing things, and that's part of its job. But the question is, who's it been producing it for? So my institute, for example, was built to develop um, technology and science to translate into private industry. And so I don't think universities um, are in any way uh, naive about what they do, because they know they've always been doing something. But then the question becomes, who are they doing it for? I think that's absolutely true. Um, but I think one of the things, uh, one of the Things I didn't get to, uh, Zoe Trout was quoting Ellison as talking about the, the sort of historical spatial symbolism. Uh, and civil rights, Ralph uh, Ellison pointing out that the, the founding forefathers were scaling this great mountain of principle that could really be something truly different, and they, at the last moment they shrunk back and decided to, to uh, seek less proud climbs. Um, and so I think the same is true of the university, that if you look at our mission statements often, uh, it talks beyond just serving business or industry or certain interests and humanity. So part of it, I think, is just taking that actually seriously. And part of it is, I think, like I said, not trying to convert every single person to the university, but you know, maybe through some, some civil activism through, uh, I, I think, just went on to your last time, senior faculty you know, stand up and say, I'm going to give tenure to this person. I'm going to vote for tenure. It might not happen to you, but because they did this. They didn't publish as many papers, but they accomplished stuff in the world. 
you know, be disobedient in a way that fits into your context and start changing it that way. Thank <laughs> you.